Good evening and welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim. I apologize about the lace for the AV. The College of Complexes consists of the following format. First, we'll have a brief announcements period. Second, we will then have our, our speakers will then speak. Third, we will have a question and answers period. And after that, you'll have your infamous rebuttal period. I would now like to attend announcements, and the first announcement is that this, uh, these proceedings will be videotaped and put on YouTube. You can look at the College of Complexes by going to the link to videos on the screen there, and all you just have to see, you'll find out right there. It's all there, going back five to almost 2010. Jim, how fast is it now? We're having the... I'm sorry, we're having Stop 5G Chicago at Janisa Cannon. Many residents of Chicago and surrounding suburbs are concerned about small cell wireless antennas being deployed in our communities. These powerful antennas, part of the next generation of wireless technology, 5G, are being placed in close proximity to our homes, schools, and offices, even though there is no science that assures their safety. The FCC human exposure to the radio frequency being used for this technology are decades out of date, and the technology has determined the results of decade-long research on RF microwave radiation and human health completed last year by the National Toxicology Program that showed clear evidence of carcinogenicity. Unfortunately, children will be exposing this radiation to 10 times greater than adults. We are asking for public health hearings and a moratorium on further <coughs> deployment of 5G until it can be humanly until it can be proven safe. Let's welcome Janisa Cannon Yay. at 5G from Chicago. There will be a couple of times when we have some videos, so uh, let's... Uh, and Kim, and why don't you introduce Kim as well? It's okay. Okay. Um, as soon as we uh, get everybody ready to go, and let's get started. Let's give her a hand again, please. Kim, uh, bring the uh, microphone a little bit to you, and if you move too far away, you'll... I'll, what you want to do is about a fist away, yeah. okay, and you're good there. Okay. okay. Better? Yes. Yeah. yeah. There you go. Yeah. So we're from Stop 5G Chicago. There are more of us, but we're representing tonight. Um, so I'm going to start off just for a second about why I started this. In January, I went to just a neighborhood meeting. And at the end of the meeting, someone had come up to me and started talking to me about 5G. And at that point, I had never heard of 5G. And um, they started talking about the fact that cell towers and cell phones were potentially dangerous. And up to that point, although I heard you know, a debate between the two, I had assumed that we were fine and that we didn't have to worry about it. You know, we'd walk around with it in our pocket. And so I realized that what I needed to do was go home and start researching. And so I've been researching ever since. Um, it's the one thing that I noticed as I started researching is that it can be quite difficult to find information. Uh, so I want to point out to begin with, so don't forget later on, that when you're trying to find information about electromagnetic radiation, also known as microwave radiation, uh, non-ionizing radiation, that it's probably best to go to duckduckgo.com, like duck duck goose, to try and remember it. Um, because Yahoo News was bought by a telecommunications company, so I don't know how much you can get through Yahoo. Google has also started to invite a uh, telecommunications company into that for them. So again, it's hard to find information on Yahoo and Google. Uh, the best website to go to is www.pubmed.gov. It's public medical research, and if you type in cell phones and what you're looking for, health effects, there's a lot of information that can come up. Um, so why exactly do we want to stop 5G? Fi what's happening with 5G is that at this point, there is no scientific research that talks about the possible, the, the possible negative health effects. 
Um, we know a little bit about 4G, we, more, we know yes. more about 2G and no. 3G, but at this point, 5G is brand new. What we know is that they're going to come into, they're already downtown Chicago, there's small cells, they go on top of light posts or on top of utility poles, and the idea is that they're going to be at the corner of every single block or every other block. So what you're looking at is having a cell tower that's every block where you're living, and it's 45 feet from your house, it's in the parkway. Uh, depending on where you are in Chicago, that could be actually be a lot closer yeah. to your house. When we were in Bucktown, or even here, the edge of the house is so much closer to the parkway that I don't know if you would even be 45 feet from these towers. And they are emitting radiation 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. And we haven't consented to this. And they are already downtown Chicago. Um, so. What exactly is, this is electromagnetic radiation. So because you have uh, electrons moving, then you have a magnetic field, you have an electric field. And so this is emitting out of not just your cell phone, but your laptops and other wireless devices. As I continue to go through, you'll see more as we uh, start. Okay, so to begin, this is um, taken off YouTube. This is from a video that Martin Paul, the professor emeritus of biochemistry and basic medical sciences from Washington State has put through. He looked at the diverse health effects on non-thermal microwave and other frequency EMFs, so that's the electromagnetic frequencies. And he has a really good synopsis as far as what we know, as far as health concerns, as far as what the health concerns are. Um, a lot of times when you hear people talk about the electromagnetic radiation, one of the first things that they say to you is, uh, these are just thermal effects. You don't have to worry about anything outside of thermal effects. But there's plenty of research at this point that says not, that is not just what we have to worry about. There's a lot that we have to worry about. So lower fertility, there are 18, sorry there. There are 18 different reviews as far as lower fertility. Changes in the structure of the testes, the ovaries, lowered sperm count, we are potentially looking at an infertility problem in the future. When you think of where people have their cell phone, men have it in their front pocket. This also has to do with cordless um, like gaming systems. Children sit with that in their lap, right where their testicles are. Not too far from the ovaries if you're a girl. What about neurological and neuropsychiatric effects? There are 25 reviews on that. Causing insomnia, fatigue, depression, headaches, lack of concentration, 21 reviews on cellular DNA damage, 13 reviews on apoptosis, programmed cell death, 19 reviews on oxidative stress and free radical damage, 12 different reviews on endocrine, which are hormonal effects. Both non-steroid and steroid hormones systems are affected. Uh, in some cases, the EMFs can produce both increased and decreased hormone activity under different conditions. There is excessive intracellular calcium, 15 different reviews on that, 35 different reviews on cancer. And at this point, you might be thinking, well, I keep, I'm told that there's nothing to worry about as far as a cell phone is concerned. I'm told that there's nothing to worry about as far as those cell towers that are on top of our Chicago public school systems. If there's all this research out there, why is it when I go to Google and Yahoo and other search engines, this stuff isn't popping up left and right? Why is it that I don't know about any of this information? So, this is um, Dr. Jerry Phillips, and he is a research biochemist from Colorado, and this is about research that he did in 1998. He was, um, I'll get it. He was funded by Motorola to study the effects of the radio frequency uh, radiation that was emitted by cell phones. And he's going to talk about the fact that to begin with, everything was fine until he started to get the research data back. It started to say there was actually something to worry about. And once that happened, that's when Motorola was like, hold on a second, 
we weren't expecting to see anything wrong. We weren't expecting for the data to come back and not show results that we're saying that there's nothing to worry about. I do, no, I do want to point out one other thing that um, Dr. George Carlo, in 1993, he also had research that he was doing. It was a six year study. $28 million was uh, spent on that research. He identified and confirmed genetic damage, but he was paid by AT&T and they wouldn't put that information out. And he wrote a letter to AT&T and said, you know, this is not right for the consumers. People need to realize that there's a possibility of damage, that there's a possibility that someone's gonna get hurt by this. And you can look this up online. Again, this is why I'm trying to make sure you got these, for those of you that are taking notes, it helps to know who you're looking for because then you can get more information. So again, Dr. George Carlo, 1993, and he wrote the letter to AT&T October 7, 1999. Exactly. Bye-bye. We're a fascist. Dictator. Which one? Sixty hertz work that we did is supported by a contract with the Department of Energy. The radio frequency radiation work that we did was supported by Motorola. The relationship was really very cordial and very stress-free, but only up until we started generating data. These folks were very, very upset and began to talk about how are they going to handle this, what sort of spin can we put on this, what can we expect from this, and from that point on the relationship changed. So what we saw was that Motorola began to insert more and more control over the work, telling us what to do. Telling us how to write abstracts, what to say in the abstracts, what to say in the papers, how to do the work. somebody new researching it and 
and I would find research that said, it's fine, don't worry about it. You, you know, we don't, you don't have to worry about cancer, you don't have to worry about DNA damage. And I would say, well, why is the research that says that? And then I realized, well, it's because it was funded by a telecommunication company. So whenever you're looking at research out there, you need to pay attention at who funded it. If it's something that says, you don't have to worry about it, we're not finding any links, make sure you are looking to see the funding. Very important as you're researching. So again, I'm gonna go back to that question again. Why haven't you heard the independent, the objective, the non-biased scientific research that's concerning electromagnetic uh, radiation that we are surrounded by at this point. Well, in the United States, we have the Federal Communications Commission, known as the FCC, and they conduct auctions of licenses for the electromagnetic spectrum. Now, you might wonder who is exactly the FCC, and we'll come back to the auctions in a second. So who is the FCC? They regulate between states and international communications for radio, television, wire, satellite, and cable in all 50 states, the District of Columbia, and the U.S. Ter uh, territories. They are an independent U.S. government agency overseen by Congress. The Commission is the federal agency responsible for implementing and enforcing America's communications law and regulations. What does that mean? They are the ones that are supposed to be looking out for us. They are the ones that are setting up the regulations. They are the ones that are controlling the safety. So if we go back to what it says up above, it says that they conduct auctions of licenses for the electromagnetic spectrum. What exactly does that mean? That when they open up certain frequencies, they sell those frequencies. What exactly does that mean? Since July of 1994, the FCC has conducted 87 of those auctions, 87 times when they were selling these frequencies for T-Mobile, Verizon, for them to use, or cable companies. The government has raised over $60 billion for this. Again, remember, the FCC is who is supposed to be regulating and watching out for us, but they are making $60 billion off the same thing that they are selling. On November 14, 2018, the FCC began auctioning the spectrum for the 5G services. In total, the FCC hopes to auction off around 6,000 licenses. The current FCC chairman, Ajit Pai, said the auction constituted more spectrum than is currently used for the terrestrial mobile broadband by all wireless service providers combined. Um, currently, Dish Network, AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile, Windstream, and Frontier Communications were among the companies that were bid, uh, bidding for the 28 gigahertz licenses for these millimeter waves. That's that So, captured agency. Um, an investigative journalist named Norm Elster wrote the captured agency and then Harvard University published it. So what exactly does it say as far as a captured, who is this captured agency? The FCC, thank you. If you take a detailed look at the FCC's actions, or their non-actions, what you're gonna see is that they pretty much grant the wireless industry what they want. The communications electronic sector has spent, so lobbying, they have spent nearly $800 million in just 2013 to 2014 alone. So they are lobbying to either stop bills from passing that would stop what they want to do, or they are lobbying to make sure that bills go through that could continue to keep doing what they want to do, like the Senate Bill 1451 that, that restricts what the cities can do as far as this 5G is concerned. The FCC sits at the core of the network. They allow powerful moneyed interests with limitless access, a variety of ways to shape those policies. Again, they are the ones that are regulating it. They are the ones that are controlling safety for us. They just turn off. No, it shouldn't have come. Okay. It's um, and that's not in our public interest. It's not, yeah. Is it a 
Yeah, now it's on. Yeah, now it's on. Oh, better? Okay. There you go. Uh, the wireless industry has been allowed to grow unchecked and virtually unregulated. And that is a problem when you're talking about our public health, when that is being ignored. Again, remember all the science that you saw to begin with. And yet they, they still aren't doing anything as far as our public safety is concerned. So who works for the cable or the wireless industry? We have Tom Wheeler, we have Aji Pai. And so when Captured Agency was written, well, I'll tell you that in a second. So Tom Wheeler, um, he worked for the National Cable and Telecommunications Association. He was the president of NABU Network, which was like the first <coughs> internet. He was the CEO of Cellular Telecommunications and the Internet Association. He was a technology entrepreneur. He was the executive at Core Capital Partners. He has a lot of background as far as telecommunication companies are concerned. IG Pai was a legal advisor concentrated on media communication issues under the U.S. Division of Equity, and he also served as the Associate General Counsel at Verizon Communications. Well, who is now responsible for regulating that same industry? Tom Wheeler and IG Pai. When Captured Agency was written, Tom Wheeler was the chairman of the FCC. Currently, IG Pai is the chairman of the FCC. So the same people that were regulating, that are worried about our public safety, were working for telecommunications best interests. So this again, this is still from Captured Agency, just to show you, you know, even how deeper it gets. Um, we have the CTIA. And so you can see it's underlined here, so Tom Wheeler, again, that was the, the, the chair, the former chair. The CTIA is the Cellular Telecommunications Industry Association. They are the main lobbying group. They advocate for their legislation to go through, for the regulatory policies, for the federal, state, and local levels, to continue the innovation, investment. They represent the U.S. wireless communications industry. And the, the former head of that was our CEO of the FCC. And then now, Meredith Baker is still currently, so she was a former FCC commissioner, so she went from that job into the CTIA, where she is now head. So she knows how it works. She knows what loops she has to jump in order to get things to pass. She already knows people from the FCC. What about the NCTA? That's the National Cable and Telecommunications Association. Again, annually one of the Washington's top lobbying spenders. They bring together diverse perspectives to forge and promote consensus so that all members can continue to drive the industry forward. Again, they're talking about the policy. They're talking about the creation. They're talking about consumer ex uh, experiences. And again, our CEO of the FCC was the head of that as well. And a, a former FCC chairman now heads, and still heads, the NCTA. And then we have the WIA, the Wireless Infrastructure Association. They represent the companies that make up the wireless infrastructure ecosystem. Um, they are the professional service firms that collect and own and operate the telecommunication facilities. And again, a former FCC commissioner is currently the head of that association. So, and they all work, or did work, for the FCC. Again, the same company that is regulating all of this, and that is supposed to be looking out for our public safety. We're either before, or are currently, working for the telecommunication companies. So as I was fact-checking this, because I wanted to make sure everything was current, the WIA are currently, this is 2019, they are honoring the wireless workforce champion and FCC commissioner, Brendan Carr. He's being recognized for his efforts to develop the wireless workforce necessary to deploy 5G. They're giving him an award because of how much he has helped with the wireless industry. So I went to the FCC website, and this is taken directly off their website. Um, and they had four strategic goals. We're not going to read through all of them, but I want to make a point here. If you look down here at strategic goal number two, promoting innovation, 
So this is for those wireless, those telecommunication companies. We want, so this is the FCC, right? The FCC wants to foster a competitive, dynamic, innovative market for communication services through policies that promote the introduction of new technologies and services. We want to really make sure that we push this stuff through, right? We want to make it look awesome. We want to ensure that the FCC's actions and regulations reflect the realities of the current marketplace. We want to promote entrepreneurship. We want to expand the ec economic opportunity that's out there. We want to remove barriers for entry and investment. Now remember, I said, they also have to do with our safety. So look over here at the strategic goal number three. Do you know what they say about our safety? You can read everything else here, but the only thing that they say about our safety is protecting public safety. Look at everything that they say about promoting innovation and wireless technologies. Let's further it. Ah, we'll protect public safety. That's it. And before I left this page, I thought it was interesting down here in strategic goal number four, that the FCC also wants to reduce regulatory burdens. We want to reduce the red tape that they have to jump through. Possibly reduce the fees that they have to worry about. We really want to get this stuff out. So how is the FCC protecting our public safety, right? What are they doing for us? There was the Telecommunications Act of 1996. And if we look at that, so currently it was written under Section 332. It's changed. You're going to see that in a second. It says no state or local government or instrumentality thereof may regulate the placement, the construction, the modification of personal wireless service facilities on the basis of environmental effects, that means your health effects, of radio frequency emissions to the extent that such facilities comply with the Commission's regulations concerning such emission. Um, legislator Senator Larry Pressler said this was the most lobbied bill in history. What exactly does it mean? You cannot cite health concerns about the effects of the, this tower radiation to deny the tower licenses based on the FCC regulations. So if they are complying with what the FCC says, you cannot stop them based on the fact that you could be sick from it. That's how they are protecting our public safety. So again, now if you're looking for this now, it's under section 704 because there was an amendment made. So if you are fact checking me, and I really hope you are fact checking me, you want to look for section 704 in the Telecommunications Act of 1996. But it even gets better. So is anyone else looking out for our safety? Well, the EPA was, right, the Environmental Protection Agency. They were tasked to develop safety standards decades ago. They were on the verge of issuing proper standards, and they had an active research program until 1996. Hmm. The same time the Telecommunications Act went through. In 1996, what happened? There was a U.S. appropriations bill that not only removed the funding from the EPA, but also stated that the committee believes the EPA should not engage in EMF activities. So they should not be researching this radiation that is emitted from cell towers, cell phones, and again, the other stuff we're going to talk about. So how were the FCC regulations for human safety determined? The International Commission on Non-Ionizing Radiation Protection, also known as ICNIRP, they have guidelines, and the International Electrotechnical Commission, the IEEE, they define the exposure limits. And they came up with what is called is SAR, the Specific Absorption Rate. And they use a model called SAM. It's a specific anthropomorphic mannequin, and that is the test model that represents us, humans. So here is one of the test models. This is SAM. And SAM is a head that is filled with a homogeneous solution. And a homogeneous solution is basically that there is salt in there. The salt is there because of the conductive properties. 
there may be sugar, but as I was trying to research this liquid, for cleaning up possibilities, there might not be sugar. Okay, so it's a homogeneous solution. And if you look, it's kind of hard if you don't know what you're looking at here. This is the cell phone against the head. So this is how they are testing how it would affect us and our brain. So if you don't understand what I just said, the liquid that they have poured in the head represents what's in our head. This is how they're testing it, okay? So it's not just that. There's, this is the same concept. So if you look at this one down here, because I have a video so that you understand how this works. Can you see these right here, these tables? So these tables are vessels, same idea as this, it's just they're sunken down. So if you, if you can kind of see here the shape of a person, and then that fluid is poured in here again with the, the salt that's in there. And what you're going to see on the video, and before we press play, I'll try and point it out, is that the cell phone is then underneath this table. It's at the bottom of that table. Now, before we go any further, I also want to point out the liquids that are back here. Again, that liquid represents our brain tissue, okay? But they change that liquid depending on the frequency that they use. So if they're testing a 2G phone, there's one liquid. If they're testing a 3G phone, there's a different liquid. If they test a Wi-Fi source, like a router, there's a different liquid. But the liquid represents our brain. Why is my brain changing in those liquids? I don't know. I don't know. So the specific absorption rate is a unit to indicate how much of this radio frequency energy is actually being absorbed by our head. So we're looking at the conductivity of the sample, that's what that salt has to do with. We are looking at the density or the permeativity of the sample, and that has to do with the electric field and how well it stays when things are polarized in that fluid. And then we're looking at the electric field sample. So we're looking at this, remember, all they tested was, are we going to heat up our brain tissue? So that's what they're looking at. At what point is this going to heat up our brain tissue? And when they see that point, they're like, oh, okay, that's the limit. That's where it's starting to heat, that's the limit. Remember, those slides at the beginning, those blue slides, none of that had to do with heating. That was all the health effects that don't have to do with heating. And so the FCC has said that our SAR level is 1.6 watts per kilogram. So when you buy a cell phone, it'll tell you what the SAR value is for that cell phone. And they have to be within this limit as far as the FCC is concerned. Okay, see in the next video. Okay, can I point out really quick? So the video is only 45 seconds, so it's, it's imp we can play it again if you want to, but no. But this is the cell phone, so we are underneath that model, those table models, and this is the cell phone, and you're only going to see that maybe for about a second, like I said, it's only 45 seconds, and then they're going to show you what the probe does on top and how it actually takes the measurements. So what 
what that probe does is it finds. Only for those people who have salt in their brains. Water people from that movie. Okay, so what that probe is doing is it's trying to find the peak electric field in that solution. And then once it finds the peak electric field, it does a 3D grid. So in the US, we look at one gram value as far as the tissue is concerned. And in uh, the European Union, they look at 10 grams. That's important to remember for a future slide, but I'll bring it back up at that point. So why do scientists state that that specific absorption rate, what they were just testing there with the, those models, why is that inadequate to protect cell phone users? Well, there are three major problems with the SAR. One are the models, two, the method, and three, the limits. So we're gonna go through each one of those. The model, it represents a man that is six feet tall, two inches, and that is 220 pounds. That's only 3% of the phone users. That means 97% of us are not being represented by those models. What about kids? It is definitely not accurate uh, metric for understanding how that is going to affect a child. Still talking about the models. So this is looking at the absorption rate for an adult, there's going to be a 10-year-old, and there's going to be a 5-year-old. And the absorption rate for the adult would be 2.93 watts per kilogram. With that same radio frequency, if you have a 10-year-old, the absorption rate is 3.21 watts per kilogram. And if you have a child that's 5, it's a 4.49 watts per kilogram. And research confirms that radiation absorption into a child's head can be over two times greater, and absorption into the skull's bone marrow can be 10 times greater than adults. <clears throat> and if you look down here, they found this out in 1996. This isn't like in 2019. This was in 1996, and nothing has been done to protect public safety. So scientists are concerned due to the research that has shown in real mammal brains that cell phone radiation ricochets through tissues and it can form hotspots. And the SAR laboratory compliance test does not integrate various internal and external environmental factors. So what if you wear glasses that have metal in them? Metal's a conductor. It's going to be very different in an electric field than something that's an insulator. What if you wear metal jewelry? Or what if you're in a classroom that has metal walls? And I can tell you that there are a lot of classrooms that have metal walls. And what does that mean for our kids when there is a Wi-Fi router in that room or close by? And then all 30 kids take out a tablet to take a test for the next three hours using that Wi-Fi. What about internal environmental factors? At no point does Sam have braces. Sam doesn't have metal filings, Sam doesn't have piercings, and Sam doesn't have implants. So if you have metal inside your body, how are you being affected? How different is it? What would the SAR value be at that point? What about our brain, right? Let's go back to the, yes? This is, no, so remember 5G, we still don't know yet. This is going back to 2G and 3G, right? 2 and 3G, yeah. So what about our brain? We're looking at that homogeneous solution that has salt in it for that conductivity, but this is what our brain looks like. We have white matter, we have gray matter, we have fluid in our brain, we have electrical impulses in our brain and that run through our bodies. How is that being affected? How can we tell that from just a liquid that is the same everywhere throughout that mannequin? Our brains are not the same throughout. What about the skull? What about the skin? There is so much here that is not being represented. Do you use the 
My cell phone is almost always on airplane mode. Um, I have, if I go to, like if I'm out, I will check possibly every half an hour to see if a call has come through, if somebody's tried to call. But otherwise, my friends know I just don't text. And it's, it's just speaker not. Phone. And speaker, thank you. If you do have the answer, you don't ever, ever put it against your head. I don't, something I didn't say, the SAM model is two millimeters away. It's not directly against the head, although I am going to get to that. So you always put it on speaker because it's like exponential distance. When you look at the force between electric stuff, the, the distance is in the denominator and it's squared. So as you get further and further away, the, the effect that you're going to have goes down quite a bit. So you don't want to put it against your head. <laughs> you know, you got to take care of this because people are into it. Okay. Reminder, just a reminder that uh, questions will come at question time, please. Okay, so this is the method. The specific absorption rate test positions, but it does not reflect the actual use patterns of how we use the phone. Manufacturers are not required to test the cell phones in positions in direct contact to the body. The common body contact positions, such as placing the phone in the pocket, are not being tested. So I pulled pictures off the, you know, off online. And this is so often, this is where I see men or boys holding their phones in their front pocket. And again, we talked about how that's affecting sperm, how that's going to affect fertility. Against our head, most people, as you, when you leave here, pay attention to how people are on their phone. It's against their head. You're going to want to go up to everybody and say, just put it on speaker. Who cares who's listening to your message? You know, just tell the person, you're on speaker, right? There's stuff that's actually made to keep it against your body, like this one and like this one. So when she goes running, she can hold it against her body. Their pants against their body. And we know of women that put it inside their bra because, you know, if somebody's going to um, come up and try and rob them, they're not going to find it there. So the cell phone is against their body. And if you look at research with breast cancer, they have found that they can see, like, the, what the phone looks like as far as how it's affected the body on the scans. And then here, pregnant women. With pregnant women, if you hold your purse, so if I were to pick up my purse and put it against me, my purse is right at my abdomen, where I'm going to keep my cell phone. There are babies that are growing there, and these women don't know about this. Nobody, I can tell you, we petition in Chicago, and we can tell you that 99% of the people, and I would venture to say close to 100% of the people, don't know any of this information. And so the amount of fetal, the, the kids that are going to be affected by this, this woman is holding it right by her belly. This sweatshirt that has a pouch in the front, so many pregnant women put their cell phones right in that pouch. It is directly against their belly. And then uh, Beyonce was pregnant here too. She's a clutch, but again, where is she holding her clutch? Right in front of her belly. Yes? Can you put your mouth a little closer to the mic? Yeah, is that better? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you. He, sorry, he, I was supposed to be further. Okay. Okay, so this is the method again. So the SAR test calculations mask the actual exposures with averaging. If you remember when I said when that probe was going in, it's finding out where the peak electric field is. Once it finds that peak electric field, it then takes data points for a gram of volume, or again for the European nations for 10 grams of volume. Those points are then averaged. And so I took two models to show you what that does to the value. This again is how they're getting that 1.6 for us. The European nations has 2.0 as far as the SAR value is concerned. So if you add 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 6, and then you divide by 4 to average it, that would mean that your SAR value was 3. The peak is 6. It's half of that. It is not a good representation of what is potentially happening when we have the cell phone there. If you have more numbers, if you look at the one below, we have a 9 plus 3 plus 1 plus 8 plus 3 plus 6. And again, when you divide by 6, you get a 5. If there was a 9, there was an 8, and a 6. There are three numbers that are greater than that. And again, in the European nations, you're talking about
about 10 grams, which means there's even more numbers that are going to be averaged out because there's more points where they're pulling off that electric field. And then the limits. We have inadequate limits. They do not protect the public awareness. So again, I've already told you about the two uh, watts per kilogram for the European Union and the 1.6 for the USA. This only has to do with heating effects. Um, it does not look at all of the scientific evidence. And again, it is independent. It is non-biased and it is objective science that says, this is what's happening, not just thermal. We've seen cancer, we've seen reproductive damage, we've seen neurodegenerative diseases, we've seen enhanced production of damaging free radicals and reactive oxygen species, we've seen membrane weakening, we've seen damage to heat shock proteins. Again, that doesn't have to do with heat. And then if you go down here, because of that science, the scientists are speaking up, and that's huge. Because when scientists speak up against companies that fund, right? These are companies that have billions of dollars. And when the scientists start to speak up and say, listen, this is something that we have to worry about. That affects their future and their funding. It's a big deal. And this is not a couple of scientists, hundreds and hundreds of scientists. And not just them. And so it says 200 scientists have taken part in the EMF scienti scientist appeal and have called for the urgent development of EMF, electromagnetic frequency guidelines, that are more protective. And even the American Academy of Pediatrics has spoken out. So this is an international appeal. And this is what the scientists have signed. And it says scientists call for protection from this non-ionizing electromagnetic field exposure. In here, they say, we have so much science that is talking about the non-thermal effects. There is too much out there for no one to have done any other testing as far as the FCC regulations are concerned. As far as SAR, the specific absorption rate, is concerned. People are not being protected. People need to be protected. That is what this is saying. And if you come over here, I'm going to try and read this one. It says, since there is controversy about a rationale for setting standards is that? Okay. to avoid adverse health effects. So we need to set standards because we know what's going on, right? We recommend that you, the United Nations Environmental Program convened and fund an independent multidisciplinary committee to explore the pros and cons of alternatives to current practices that could substantially lower human exposure to radio frequencies and the extremely low frequency fields. The deliberations of this group should be conducted in a transparent, let's tell everybody what we're doing, and an impartial way, science-based. Although it is essential that industry be involved and cooperate in this process, industry should not be allowed to bias its processes or its conclusions. This group should provide their analysis to the UN and the WHO to guide preca uh, precautionary action. Why are they saying that? Because as you continue to look at these associations, the ones that are protecting us internationally, they also have scientists that are funded by these telecommunication companies. They are also captured. And you have to understand that when you look at the science out there and you see somebody saying, this is not good, this is the result of what's happening with these radio frequency radiation, and somebody else says, no, it's okay, look at the funding, look at who is telling them to say that. Super important. So here are the signatures of the scientists. So this goes through many different countries, Australia, Austria, I can't really read this one. Canada, China, I'm not going to read through it all. This is international. But you can see that there are a lot of signatures. And this is the American Academy of Pediatrics. And I realize that the letter is small, but I didn't want anybody to think that I was changing anything by copying and pasting it, so I just took a picture of it. And then I pulled out a couple of the important facts. So they want to protect children's health and well-being. Current FCC standards do not account 
for the unique vulnerability and use patterns that are specific to pregnant women and children. We want them to reflect current use patterns, the number of mobile phone calls per day, the length of each call, the amount of time people use mobile phones has increased, while cell phone and wireless technology has undergone substantial changes. Children born today will experience a longer period of exposure to radio frequency fields from cellular phone use than adults will, because they start using cell phones at earlier ages, and they will have longer lifetime exposures. They also want to provide meaningful consumer disclosure. The current metric of radio frequency exposure available to consumers the specific absorption rate is not an accurate predictor of actual exposure. The American Academy of Pediatrics is supportive of FCC developing standards that provide consumers with information to make informed choices in selecting mobile phone purchases and help parents better understand any potential risk for their children. And because somebody had asked me before, do I use a cell phone? As far as my children are concerned, they are not allowed to use our cell phone. Yay. They have a tablet, but it is always on airplane mode. And the only reason they have a tablet is because Santa didn't know any of this in December. I started researching this in January. Santa also bought our kids a PlayStation 4 with uh, controllers that didn't have wires. Once I started researching this and realized that's all the same radiation, everything got wired. So the limits continue. Uh, the SAR test can have a 30% margin of error. What does that mean? The number that they give you can be off, either up by 30% or down by 30%. That, that's an uncertainty there. That's a lot of extra exposure that we don't know about. And so there were attorneys, Swankin and Turner, the road alerts of the FCC saying, okay, there's a 30% margin of error, and the FCC has not returned a letter back to them. So because we're talking about the G's, just so that you understand, the next two studies that we're looking at, and I've got to pick up pace because I'm running out of time, I also, are the 2G and the 3G. And so they use different frequencies depending on the generation of the phones. So this is one of the biggest uh, studies that have been performed. This one is the NTP, the National Toxicology Program, through the National Institute of Health. It is the most comprehensive research study. It took about 19 years and it cost $25 million. They tested 90 animals. They tested both rats and mice. And this is the effect from like the actual cell phone. The next study I'm talking about is about from like a cell tower. And not to get into specifics, we can come back to that at the end. What were the results? So the heart, a statistically significant increase in the heart schwannoma a tumor on the nerve in male rats. The heart schwannoma, the schwannoma is what makes the myelin. The myelin is what insulates the impulses that are traveling from the brain to the heart. Those electrical impulses, these are electric fields that we're talking about, that is getting affected, that heart schwannoma in male rats. Significantly increased incidence, I'm over here if you're wondering, of right ventricular cardiomyopathy in several treatment groups. For the brain, there was increased incidence. Uh, it did not reach statistical significance of malignant gliomas in all the groups of the GSM male rats and some of the CDMA groups. The GSM and the CDMA it has to do with the technology of how your phone works. One of them is more used in the U.S., one of them is more used abroad. Okay, just to give you an idea what that is. The adrenal glands, there was some evidence of tumors, benign, malignant, or complex combined pheno phenochromocytomas. And I looked that up. That's a rare tumor of the adrenal gland tissue. It results in the release of too much epinephrine and the hormones that control the heart rate, the metabolism, and the blood pressure. The litter rate, weights, there was a decrease in litter weights. And then DNA damage significantly increased in the frontal cortex of male mice for both modulations. Peripheral leukocytes of female mice, what does that have to do with? That has to do with your white blood cells. That has to do with your lymphatic system. That's the part that tries to help you be healthy. That's what fights the bad stuff that goes into your body. And that is being affected. And then the hippocampus of the male rats. 
And that has to do with your memories, your learning, your emotions. There was also a sister study, the Ramazzini study. Now this one focused not on the cell phone itself, but more on the cell tower. This is the far field radiation. Um, and this one is important because there are so many rats. There's close to 2,500 rats. The last one only had 90. This one also is very important because it was for the lifespan of the rat. So and that hadn't been done before so either. And remember, when we're looking at cancer, it can take 10 to 15 years in humans. So what were the results? The heart, a statistically significant increase in the heart schwannoma in male rats treated at the highest dose. An increase in the incidence of Schwann cells hyperplasia in male and female rats treated the highest dose. An increase in the effects in the Schwann cells of the heart of male rats when one looks at hyperplasia of Schwann cells combined with all the schwannomas of the heart. So we're hearing the same thing that we had just seen in the last study. The brain, an increase in the incidence of malignant glial tumors was observed in female rats treated at the highest dose, but did not reach statistical significance. And when you come over here and you look at that statistical significance, what the author said was, even though there's, it's low, possibly, as far as the brain tumors are concerned, when you are talking about billions of people at this point that have cell phones, that's talking about thousands of brain tumors. So, you know, maybe not so much in the low number of rats, but magnify that to how many cell phones and cell towers are out there. Um, also in the author's notes, there was a, an Italian man who had worked, um, and where he worked for six hours a day, he had to use a cell phone or he had to use uh, a cordless telephone. And he had a heart schwannoma tumor, which is very rare. That's what we're talking about up here in the heart. And he actually won in court and was compensated for it. So we're starting to see this. Oh, and something I just realized that I don't have on this. Realize that the cell phone companies don't have insurance. Lloyd's of London said no. Swiss RE said, oh no. So what does that mean? That means when Chicago puts 5G on your corner and something happens to you, you're going to sue Chicago because there is no insurance company. Well, who does that affect? All the taxpayers that are paying for all that money that comes out. So here are all the devices. They're going to pop up one by one that are emitting this, this non-ionizing radio frequency radiation. So I'm going to start going through it because of time. The controller systems for kids, this one has no wires and you cannot wire it. My son wanted to get it, we said no. The wireless earbuds, the keyboards and the mouse that you have now that doesn't have a wire on it. Your microwave, a smart bench. I started looking for a mattress and you're sleeping on something that is radiating out. I don't know, to tell you how many times you flip in the middle of the night? Like really, why do you want that? Your cordless phone, the watch that you wear, the cell towers that, like I said, are on Chicago Public School buildings, the Roku, there are going to be smart houses. The smart meters, you might not realize, but your electric meter, your water meter, your gas meter, for sure you're electric, those are smart, which means that there's radiation coming off of them. Those doorbells that so many people have, those are smart, there's no, that's radiation. The gaming consoles, your Wi-Fi router, your tablets, your iPads, your Bluetooth headset. When you ask Alexa if it's raining out, you're getting hit by some radiation. What about the Bluetooth enabled vehicles? I don't think you can buy one anymore that isn't Bluetooth enabled. And we went to our car, we researched it, and you cannot turn it off, at least from what we can see. You can't put it off, really? You can't turn it off, that's what we found. And look at this one. Did anybody see this one? A smart diaper. Do you know what a smart diaper is? It tells your phone that your child has wet their diaper or pooped. Because it's that hard to go and look. If you lock your kid in a cage at home, and a baby monitor. Oh yeah, right. So, yes, I gotta hurry. So super quick, and there is one, can we show one more video? So our legislators have started to write letters to the FCC. This is Richard Blumenthal, he's a senator for Connecticut. Anthony DeFazio, he is a representative for Oregon. Uh, can't get to that. And Thomas Richard Swosey, who's a representative for New York. They have written letters to the FCC. They've said, listen, you need to change guy lights. You need to let consumers know what's going on. You're saying 5G is okay. What science do you have that says 5G is okay? 
When somebody comes up to you and says, was she wearing a tin hat when she was up there? Say to them, show me your science. That's what you say. Show me what makes you believe that 5G isn't going to hurt us. Show me the numbers. Right? And the GAO, of tell, um, this is the Government Accountability Office, they told the FCC in 2013 that they had to figure this out. They had to do something about this. Nothing has been done. So here's a video that I would like you to see before I go to sleep. Okay. Charlie, because you used to be working. Charlie's deeply disturbing to us. I'm not just So this is Senator Blumenthal, and he's talking. This is Senator Blumenthal, and he's talking to attorneys for of a telecommunication company. He's asking them about 5G. Thank you for having this hearing. We've heard from louder a lot of witnesses from you today and others about the very important potential of five G technology is promised to us to bring us a new era of connectivity with internet speed much five times faster than what we have today with much lower latency, and that's all a good thing. But uh, 5G is well known <coughs> the higher frequency waves that don't travel as far and will rely on a network of hundreds of thousands, potentially millions of small cell sites. And the question then is, are there any health implications or safety implications to those additional sites that are likely to be located? close to homes, schools, workplaces, and closer and closer to ground. Correct? Correct, sir. Yes. So, in December of 2018, I sent a letter to FCC Commissioner Carr asking him to cite for me recent scientific studies demonstrating the safety of this technology, what research has been done, where has it been published and compiled? He has essentially failed to do so and just echo the general statements of the FDA, which shares regulatory responsibility for cell phones with the FCC. If you go to the FDA website, pretty unsatisfactory. Um, they're basically uh, is a cursory and superficial citation to existing scientific data saying, quote, the FDA has urged the cell phone industry to take a number of steps, including support and additional research on possible biological effects of radio frequency fields for the type of signal emitted by cell phones. Um, I believe that Americans deserve to know what the health effects are. Not to prejudge what scientific studies may show, and uh, they deserve also a commitment to do the research on the outstanding questions. So, my question for for you, particularly Mr. Gillen and Mr. Berry, uh, how much money has the industry committed to supporting additional independent research? Independent research. Is that independent research ongoing? Has any been completed? Where can consumers look for it? Um, and we'll talk about research on the biological effects of this new technology. Thank you, Senator. I, I think, uh, thank you for your focus on the issue. Uh, safety is paramount, and as you alluded to, we rely on the expert agencies, we rely on the findings of the FDA and others as to the requirements to keep all of us safe. Uh, there are no industry back studies to my knowledge right now. Happy to visit with you as to what uh, opportunities you think there needs to be more studies and we're always for more science. We also rely on what the scientists tell us. More than zero. More than zero. Would be just answer my question, how much money? Zero. Uh, I can sort of certainly follow up with you, Senator. To my knowledge, there's no active studies being backed by industry today. Anybody else know of industry commitments to, to back research 
funded, supported, to ascertain scientifically the health effects. Senator, I'm not aware um, either, but uh, I do know that with the small cells especially, you're going to have lower power levels. And of course, as, as from a carrier perspective, you want to be able to manage interference so that that interference is the lowest you know, interference possible. So uh, I, would, I would think that some of those studies or some of that information could be utilized in, uh, in looking at the health consequences, but no, I'm not aware of it. So there really is no research ongoing. We're kind of blind, blind here, as far as health and safety. All right. Okay. Okay. I guess we now go to questions. And uh, we, need a we need a moderator up there to uh, Karina, help. Karina, you want to? Would you mind moderating, Karina? Whoever. All right. One more round for our yeah. speakers, please. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, why don't you introduce yourself then? I'm Janessa Cannon. I'm also with Staff T or Staff 5G Chicago. You wanna, you wanna, All right. Uh, if people have questions, please raise your hand. I'm going to try to give everybody the first one question. Make sure everybody is able to ask one question before going back to the hall. Justin. Are you, uh, ladies, familiar with uh, Derek Rose? He's running for mayor. Come on, it's quiet. We got questions coming. Sorry. On a, on a, he's running for mayor of Houston on a stock 5G platform. I was just curious if, you, if you're familiar with, with, with him. Is he <sighs> recent? Very recent, yes. I was going to say because we stay up to date. Uh, we'll Use the mic. What did you say his name was again? Derek Bros, B R O Z. The question was uh, whether the ladies were familiar with Derek Bros, who's running for mayor of Houston, Houston on an anti 5G platform. Should look it up. Yes, okay. All right. Joyce. Remember to use the mic. This is, this is kind of a technical question. I just found out that I have Wi Fi without wanting Wi Fi. It's in my modem. So if you have a modem, I have everything wired. Yet I have a modem. Oh, yeah. And inside, so I, they said they would disconnect it from their office. Does that mean if it's disconnected, it still gives out the radiation? No. So the question is, she has a modem, and the modem, she found out the modem has Wi-Fi, but the company said they would disconnect the Wi-Fi. Is the modem still going to give out radiation? Um, they, they will disconnect it, um, but just so everybody knows, if you do, if you take that process and don't want to turn it off uh, by your, uh, like on your own, every time there's an update in that system, it's going to kick it back on. So you want to make sure, and the thing is, is when we get updates, sometimes we don't know we have them, so it might be a good thing to maybe randomly check here and there to see if maybe an update went, went through. Yes, ma'am. I had a phone call, like 20, 25 years, and I opened it up, and nothing happened. She's had a phone for 25 years. It hasn't affected her health. I mean, I know. <coughs> Please. Speak it to the mic. Have you had checkups? Yeah. Have they checked your entire body, every single inch? Well, remember too that when you're looking at 25 years, you're looking at different generations of phones. And so 25 years ago, the way that you use the phone is quite different from the way that you use a phone today. So you're using a phone a lot more for like where it's on you and on and where you're talking on it versus how it was 25 years ago. But one of the things as far as the research is concerned is, as far as cancer is concerned, it can take 10 to 15 years before we start to see it. So if we're looking at the way that we're using it now, where we're using it so much more frequently, how is that going to affect us in the future? And then, you know, you do not necessarily know if something is happening until it happens. It's just, it's not good to continue using it based on the 
Um, can I just say that? Yes. I think it's important to note as well. I mean, when uh, we've been networking with doctors and scientists, and when you really look deep in it, I mean, headaches, constant headaches, neck aches. I'm not talking about you in general. I'm talking about everyday things we may come in contact with and not realize it's coming from electromagnetic radiation. Um, we sometimes don't correlate the two. So, um, lack of sleep. I mean, it's an array of issues. Yes, ma'am. In yellow. Oh. Um, well, I just wanted to add that it's not just, you know, what the one source, like your cell phone, but now we're getting more and more body burdens because when the 5G is installed, there'll be many more okay. sources of this radiation coming at us, so it's... I would also like to say, uh, you're lucky, I'm glad that you haven't seen any results because there are, there's such thing as called electro, electric hypersensitivity, and doctors are treating these cases today. Um, if you have doctors that acknowledge them, and you know what to look for, I mean, they misdiagnose things because of the fact that they don't acknowledge this is harmful. Yes, sir. Well, the phone is turned off. Do you still get the radiation if you hold it your body? Or is it Not if it's off. If um, airplane mode as well. Um, the only thing with airplane mode is you do have to make sure you have more than one antenna in your phone. So you do have to make sure that all of the antennas are turned off. So airplane mode should be fine, but you, you have to check that it's turning off all of the antennas that you have. But it's the best thing to do is to turn it off. And, and just to add on to that, when your phone is on, if like say you don't have it on, on airplane mode, you want to make sure that you go into your phone manually and you disconnect the Bluetooth and the Wi-Fi because if you're not on your phone using it, it's going to turn off of every cell phone power that you pass. Um, and we all have acoustometers, we measure this stuff. Um, it's it's an alarming amount of radiation coming off of a, one cell phone. Dave Zucker. Yes, I realize he's retired and an old man by now. But to what extent, if any, in the conflicts of interest that you mentioned concerning the FCC, has the former chairman, Newton Minow, been involved in those conflicts of interest? He's asking about the former chairman of the FCC, Newton Minow. Not to my knowledge, um, but it's definitely, I mean, this has just been one reveal after another, so we'll definitely well, He was the one who, back in the early 60s, when he was chairman during the Kennedy administration, said that television was a vast wasteland. We'll, we'll definitely take a look to see if it goes that deep, for sure. Ellen? <clears throat> yeah, uh, just one little and a big question. Is the, um, I have two, two modems now. Is that worse than one? Is the Wi-Fi that bad uh, where that's, I should just have one? Like, I thought one would be better, and I haven't turned off the other one. So no wireless. Do you have what? one? Do you have it to where <coughs> you're get, not getting connection in another in the room? The other part of the room. Right. Right. So, um, I mean, we've, I've completely got rid of my Wi-Fi. Um, <coughs> if you have to have Wi-Fi on, it's really important that you turn it off at night. That's when we're at most vulnerable, and that's when our, our bodies are healing itself. So just turn it off at night. Um, and you can have, um, you can have your house wired so that you don't need to have Wi-Fi. So that you're like plugging in, you know what? Do you remember when you used to use computers and that blue cord so that you can plug it in instead? Okay, yeah. <laughs> so that's better than uh, that's better than better. the Wi-Fi. Questions? And it's faster. That's right. And this is cumulative, right? So this is again, this is bombarding us from so much stuff in our house, and it's it's building. Is is there motion in Washington to get through to any sponsors or advocates of this? Concern like Blumenthal, do you, do you feel like we're going to be able to stop it at the supply side? Um, he's, he's done the most. Um, I would say we have a really good chance with Blumenthal, um, but I did catch wind that, that San Diego was trying to do the same thing that we are in Chicago, trying to stop the implementation. And I know that somewhere along the lines they got held up because the Telecommunications Act of 1996 did hold them back from fighting them on installing them due to health. So we're going to find barriers, unfortunately, until you know we just have more. We need more states to, to step up and. Well, and we need people to start calling in. We need people to start calling the mayor and saying, "Listen, what's going on about this?" We need people calling their aldermen and saying, what's going on about this? Because we found from sitting down with aldermen that if you're not a constituent that votes for them, they really don't care what you have to say. So even though we are calling all the aldermen in the city of Chicago, the one who really cares is, is our alderman. And it's really important for you to spread the word and get people to start calling and saying, are you putting this on my block? Because what we found is ComEd just lost um, a lawsuit against Crown Castle 
and they were saying that some of the utility poles uh, were in disrepair. And so we're starting to look at the fact that this 5G is coming out. So in our neighborhood, all these utility poles were laying on the ground, and we were like, what's going on here? So we went up to a technician, and we said, is this for 5G? And he said, if it's a 40-foot pole, you're OK. But if it's a 45-foot pole, it is to get ready for uh, 5G. And although two of the ones that we saw were 40, there was one that was 48 feet tall to get ready for 5G. So it is coming. Remember, it is already downtown Chicago. And it's in other neighborhoods. What should be? Just that generation. Yeah. It's a different frequency. Dr. Laura, yeah, we just had a tremendous win on this, you guys. <coughs> Yesterday, Sorry. Um, we had a, a um, court ruling. The NRDC and uh, some tribes, First Nation tribes, took the FCC to court. Um, and because uh, remember, this is, is there a, a question, or is this a rebuttal? Yeah, so I'm, I'm trying to add to the information there. And um, it's a question we, time. It's not an information. Time. Right, okay. right, right, right. So, so, anyways, we had a tremendous um, court Come to ruling, the question. and we can uh, now be appealing to our elected officials to um, ask for environmental impact studies on all of these all right, sightings. Okay. Well, yeah. This is. Yeah. So okay. talk about talk well, about the ruling. Question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Paul Racino. I have a question. In my research and in your presentation, you mentioned millimeter uh, radiation. Where is that used? So that is the 5G. That's the millimeter wave. No, it's not. Well, yeah, it's technically it. micro, but they called it the millimeter wave. Microwaves, five, microwaves and millimeter radiation are a higher frequency yeah. than what is used by 4G and 5G. No, that's what 5G is. That is, that's what 5G is. It, it's the millimeter waves. It's a higher frequency and a higher frequency. No, it's not. I think, um, I think it's important to note also that this 5G technology, it's we're not getting rid of 4G. We're not getting rid of 3G or 2G. Everything will still be used. So on top of that, this has never been tested. I see where you're coming from, but I, I don't truly want to take the chance of having three young children that aren't fully developed that absorb this quicker. It, it, 5G is 4G plus microwave coming down the pipe. That's not what my research shows. That's what our research shows. Okay. <laughs> Let's put this into the rebuttal period. Next question, please. Ms. Rios, right behind you. Yeah, um, I, I want to ask three not 5G questions, but um, microwave. So we just bought our first microwave, and I was so happy because I felt like I was in the 21st century. So what do I do? I mean, um, do I just not stand in front of it while it's... Give it question it. about a microwave, or Brew, microwave, brewing or, the or actual microwave get rid of it get rid of it yeah, yeah it's, they're pretty oh, okay or stand, stand in another room yeah. and then we have a roku upstairs and a roku downstairs one i sit right next to so what do we do get rid of those so the questions we, are microwaves and rokus yes we unplugged our roku we took it off the wall so it wasn't working roku and, how, and what's your opinion about microwave um, so, I don't have a microwave, so I can't test the microwave. Um, the idea behind the microwave is that based on the grid that's on the front door, the wavelength can't get out. The wavelength's bigger than the grid, it can't fit through. But you don't necessarily have a complete closed off because the door opens, right? And I can say that a video that I saw on YouTube, again, I can't, you know, tell you that I know this for myself. But he went into another room and it was still affecting his acoustometer. Remember that the cell towers that are outside travel far distances and come into your house to still work, right? So even going around the, the wall isn't necessarily going to protect you. Our questions, Tim Bolger. I want to know what you think about the frequency modulation and particularly amplitude modulation between the 560 spectrum and the 1520 spectrum. <laughs> he means radio yes, frequency. Yes, uh, yes, related to what, Tim? Related to what? What well, that's the radiation that comes off the amplitude modulated band for all your car radios and frequency modulation for your FM radios. Right. So are you talking about the health effects? Uh, or the, the health effects of it because there's also short wave. There's also lots yeah, more the right in the radio frequency spectrum than yeah, just the short term 5G. 
Do people have questions that are questions? Do you, uh, do you want me to take that one? Sure. Okay, so the American Heart Association does recommend that um, people with pacemakers stay away from ham radios and other radios. Did you know that? Yes. Go on the American Heart Association and look for devices that interfere with pacemakers and intracardiac defibrillators, okay? They also say to stay away from the TSA scanners, which are microwave, and all of the wireless routers. So if you have cardiac problems at all, even if you think you might have cardiac problems, you might want to go on the American Heart Association's website and look at all of their records. How can I then hear, hear HCJB out of Quito, Ecuador? <laughs> so, all right, questions. Folks. Just don't stand next to uh, All right. Only so you would have that problem. Five million the watts corner. of pure and adult yeah. rock and roll power. Yeah. All right. Do we have any more questions? Wait, sir. Oh. We were yeah. in the middle of a question. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. My apologies. What's your letter? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Most of the time, if you get a base model, they will not be. Right. Oh, thank you. Okay. Because I was, not that we're in the market to buy a car, but I was wondering about that. And a friend of ours, also a South IG, bought an older car because she didn't want to have the, the Wi Fi in the car. Yeah, you can buy a new car, you just get the base one. All that is on the upper model. Thank you. Charles Paydock. Yeah, I used to live in the country. They're kind of afraid of newfangled things. But seriously, since 1760 or so, at the onset of the Industrial Revolution, every new technological advance has been challenged as being dangerous. How do we know this isn't just another one? So the question is, is that there's paranoia about past advancements, and how do you know that the this... light bulb was dangerous. That, that that this isn't along the lines of the light bulb being dangerous. And I think with all the information provided tonight, um, when we look at, are you talking about 5G in particular, or are you talking about just cell phone radiation? Well, all of the previous uh, fears of technology have not materialized. <laughs> like, like tobacco? Plastics? Like uh, fossil fuels? That's a technology? That's a technology? Round up? DDT? That's yeah, not a technology. How about the hip replacement? They said the steam engine was dangerous. The hernia mesh? How about the mesh? Yeah, how about the glitter? How about climate change? All right, Jane. Jan, I'm sorry. I apologize. Jane. Right. I'm, I'm sorry. This is not a. I'm answering this question. All of those technologies have not been processed properly. Anytime something will make money, it goes on the market, and nobody cares whether it's good, bad, or indifferent. So, and, uh, look, at the, look at what's happening in Willow Springs with the uh, with. Stereogenics. Stereogenics. What's that chemical? Um, oxi uh, ethylene oxide. Ethylene oxide. I mean, somebody once said, you know, with other, we were talking about nuclear power, of course, and somebody, yeah. I heard somebody say, well, with other, with other industries, when they make a mess, they have to clean it up. No, they don't. People never clean up after themselves. Yeah. They throw things into the environment and just walk away from it. You know, right. All right, folks. Right. Right. So, so, are we all done with so questions, so or are there any questions? Question questions with a question mark. Uh, yes, ma'am. Okay. Did Did you guys know that um, there was a decision by the uh, the U.S. Uh, Court of Appeals okay. in the District of Columbia that overturned part of the FCC ruling regarding? Um, uh, the uh, environmental studies, <coughs> the uh, NEPA, and also the National Historic Preservation Act. So that they they overturned and they ruled that when cell uh, cell small cells or cell cell towers are placed or antennas any of that are placed, they have to have an environmental study done with them. That was two days ago, right? That came yeah. Out? yeah. Okay. All right. Yes. Right. And do you have any any reaction to it? What do you, um, what's we've, your take on we've it? We've been so busy with this PowerPoint motion. <laughs> there, 
when I was doing research, this was quite some time ago, but they were already, if there was supposed to be something potentially in the environment that could be affected by this, they were already supposed to be filling out forms as far as the environment was concerned. So one of the first things that I did when we started doing this was what kind of endangered and threatened species do we have in the region that we're talking about? And have they filled something out? And as I was researching, there's never been any of those environmental documents filled out. They just pretend like there's nothing going to be affected. So they're, that they are already supposed to be doing that. It'd be nice to see that it's enforced. But now we can sue about it. Right. Hey, uh, who has questions? All right. Uh, uh, Mr. Jack Bean, please. Last question, I'm going to miss please. this, but uh, what is this big deal about this 5G? Why are they well, wanting to push this you down the road other what, what than is the, somebody why, why are, some money? What's the benefit, for, or what, why are we upgrading the 5G? What is... So the idea is that you can download stuff a lot faster. So if right now it take if right now it takes 24 seconds to download something, with 5G the idea is that it would download in one second. Um, because this is a shorter frequency, it can carry far more data. Um, and because it's a shorter frequency, that's why there has to be so many of them on the block. So that's why there's one on a corner, one on a corner, because it's a larger frequency. Oh, no. Sorry, that's shorter wavelength, higher shorter frequency. Right, right. Sorry. All right. I, okay, so we'll it can carry a lot more data. So eventually, they are looking at the fact that cars can drive themselves. Also, potentially in the future, as far as like medical is concerned. I think we're done with questions because uh, we now have to move on to rebuttals. It's it's a hard that deadline. is about eight o'clock. If you guys want to get up there and speak, how many want to rebut tonight? Now well, that means you got something you want to say. All right. Uh, it doesn't have to be on top. Back on the projector, Caitlin. Just flip the projector back. Push the power button back on. All right, Margaret left. She did. Did she pay her bill? We're going to run a strict time limit of three minutes. Let's thank our speakers. Okay. Oh, my, my brain hurts. Oh. Oh. Honor of Monty Python. Uh, I'm making a joke here, but I guess it's not a joke. I, I, this 5G thing snuck up on me. I could say, uh, um, you know, in the honor of uh, Bill Hartman, you know, uh, he used to do caveman lawyer. Some of you know about Saturday Night Live. <laughs> As a caveman physicist, and I do have a physics degree, I mean, um, I don't understand this urgency about getting this 5G going. Yes, um, that's what I heard, that yes, you can download uh, um, a Gilgan's Island, I guess, faster, so you can find out whether Marianne is prettier than, than, uh, than Ginger in one episode or something like that, faster. Uh -huh. Seems to be ridiculous. Um, the the self-driving cars, that's something that uh, I've always been concerned about after hearing that uh, they're going to roll that out. They're going to put everybody out of out of um, uh, what job uh, but uh, drive the truck and whatnot. Um, even these Uber <laughs> drivers that, you know, they quit their regular job, which was crummy, and then they got a crummy Uber, Uber job where they're barely, uh, many of them can't even pay for the loan they uh, got to, to get this newfangled car that they're, I mean, it's all such a mess. Capitalism is doing this to us. So it's um, it's a terrible thing. Um, yes, uh, the five G. From what I've heard, I haven't been able to make a careful study of it myself. But uh, it's um, another thing. One wasn't discussed is that the, uh, uh, the U.S. government agency that hasn't been gutted by Trump uh, has been complaining that this five G is going to definitely interfere with their weather forecasts because it will interfere with the um, the frequency it's always about frequency the frequency of the water molecules that they're using from satellites to determine uh, water vapor um, uh, rates uh, how much water vapor there is in the atmospheres so they won't be able to predict for example um, as they are getting these predictions better about where these hurricanes are going 
to, if you're going to hit our coast because of global warming, we won't be able to protect as well. So therefore, oh, you know, they might say, uh, well, it could hit, again, it'll go back to where they're saying, well, it could be over three or 400 mile range that it could hit. So uh, it's all just a terrible mess. And there should be somebody that has the uh, grown up ability to say, um, let's halt until we can find out about the safety of this 5G nonsense. Well, I can't bring it out. Yay. Okay, next. There's a strict three minutes tonight. <coughs> Thanks for your presentation. I've done some research on, on 5G myself, and I'll probably be presenting on that uh, in, in addition to other topics. Um, but I have to say that um, 5G is actually, in my opinion, uh, from what I've seen so far, actually far more dangerous than, than what you presented. And, and you all did a good job of uh, showing some of the dangers. Uh, but it seems to be <clears throat> also a weapons system and a surveillance system. And it's very nefarious. Now, uh, what I want to talk about really is that there are physical attacks of being perpetrated on the American people. 5G is one of them, it's, but that's coming. But already we've been attacked uh, through chemtrails, uh, vaccines, fluoride, and many other uh, poisoning uh, of the American people in a flagrant, terrible way. Okay, but there are also psychological attacks. Um, the, uh, the moon landing I've talked about, that was a huge psychological operation on the American people and the world for that matter. And another uh, big psychological uh, attack that's uh, being carried out right now on the American people is these quote unquote mass shootings. There are no mass shootings of the kind uh, hyped up by the media, okay? Uh, when you look into uh, Orlando, Las Vegas, Parkland, and many others, it's pure bull crap nonsense, okay? It, just, the slightest uh, research that you do on them will show you that it, it, there's a pattern of deception. It's just lies, okay? And so they, they're pushing this agenda of uh, fear, divide and conquer, pitting people against each other. Now they're pushing this white supremacy thing. If you, I, I was listening to NPR and, and uh, WBEZ over the past few days because I drive for a living and, and I you know, have the radio on. 24-7, <clears throat> you know, uh, uh, this, this supposed problem with guns and, and, and leading to white supremacy and uh, all kinds of other dangers, okay? Um, I don't favor uh, no gun restrictions at all, okay? I favor some kinds of gun control, but they're pushing for something far worse, uh, ushering in tyranny. How much time do I have? Uh, two, two minutes? Okay. Right. All right, um, so if, when you look at um, this uh, El Paso thing, it fits the same pattern. Pure lies, pure nonsense, no uh, video surveillance uh, 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 sh uh, sh being shown about it. Uh, there was a drill beforehand, as usual. There was, pr there, there was prior knowledge, people putting up Facebook pages, whatever, uh, uh, fund, fund, go fund me or whatever, okay, before the damn thing happened. And when you read this um, uh, so-called so uh, manifesto by this guy, okay, I don't have time to go through it. Uh, I, I'd like to read a couple passages, but I don't have time. It's written by a, an, an academic, somebody who, a well-educated person, uh, uh, probably uh, 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 an MA or, or a even PhD. I, I, I know about these things. I'm an academic myself. It was not written by a 21-year-old uh, with uh, a year and a half of community college and uh, about to become a homicidal maniac. It's pure nonsense, OK? Uh, you should really look into this kind of thing. All right. Okay. Next. OK. Wait a minute. Um, I'm Dr. Laura Chamberlain. I work with these ladies, and um, they are Stop 5G Chicago, and a, a, a group of us are 5G Crisis Chicago Land Network, but we're working to say together. Okay, uh, just to be clear about what 5G is, okay, it's three levels of technology that's coming down that have several uh, sub-levels of technology that had to be developed, okay? So the small cell towers that you're seeing being built right now in Chicago, how many people have seen a guy with a hazmat suit in their alley putting up what looks like laptops onto a utility pole? Anybody seen it? Yeah, okay. I, a lot, I've had a lot of reports of this. So it's, um, it's a cone on top, and then it has three to five like uh, laptops that ha have heavy um, electrical cords to them, and they're up on the utility pole about at the second floor. Okay? So if you're on a second floor apartment and you're near one of these, you're looking right at it, practically. Um, I've taken my meter out to these. There's one in Rogers Park at um, Pratt and Wayne, 
and I've taken my meter and um, immediately under the pole it's about 25 to 30 times normal and then it slowly goes down to normal at about 200 feet in every direction so if anybody's home their front yard their backyard their uh, back their porch is you know within that 200 feet which a lot of them are then they're being constantly bombarded um, by this radio frequency that is way higher than it should be um, that is one of the problems with 5g is you know, the 4g cell towers are on the top of the buildings right now and so they're putting these small cell towers right down in our neighborhood right outside our doors every two to ten homes that's the number one the health risk okay basic health risk number two they're going to then add microwave uh, transmitters onto these um, utility poles and then they're going to broadcast microwave and that's a frequency somewhere between 20 gigahertz and 90 gigahertz depending on which uh, telecom you're talking about that is completely untested for mass uh, you know use in our environment and in fact the Department of Defense developed microwave as a weapon so that that was the first uh, utilization of microwave okay then they put it in your little box right. that you want to cook your uh, you know popcorn with and I highly don't recommend that okay just get rid of it I, I did years years ago and um, it's not good for your food it's not good for your body and then and but there are going to be up, Dr. Laura. rolling this microwave out the third level of Your time uh, technology is up. i understand third level Your time is, is, is uh, 20,000 satellites that are going to beam microwave into our environment that's the third level of technology build up and basically we're allowing them to put uh, microwave uh, weapons in space that could that are a national security issue so I really highly recommend that you look into this this is some people have actually said this time, in um, time, in uh, time, time, public meetings time. they've actually we, said we, is this a time is off scheme? please uh, so, get going I have more information give Laura my time if she has more to say because she's obviously studied more of this than I have. Uh, um, my name's Ellen Corley and I love this free speech forum for, because this is what it takes to uh, hopefully, you know, if we could do this on a worldwide level, it, we'd have a chance of surviving. But unfortunately, um, the, the government does uh, control our speech um, through our mass communication system if you look at social media uh, really there's a lot of science in this that we're basically silenced you know um, through you don't hear anybody else talking about it because the editors don't allow you to talk about it uh, NPR I listened to all day it, that was they moved into the Voice of America building in Washington eight years ago, I remember, which is a known CIA front group you know, that was started in um, Europe, right, to, uh, by Reinhard Gellin to, you know, control the, let's blame Russia for everything, you know, a very convenient enemy. Uh, but by the FCC uh, fairness doctrine that, which came in the same year the National Security Act came through, uh, they, that was supposed to say that the broadcast media has to be, has to be answerable to the, public, uh, to the public interest. You know, um, that's, you, the responsibility has to start at the top. The, you know, brought it, actually what was happening in 48 was that the guy that owned the, the broadcast media and the South was orchestrating a Ku Klux Klan rally with the only broadcast media in town. And um, they're like, they were smart enough at the time to put in this law that, you know, we give these companies, AT&T or 
um, you know, the utilities are this stuff for free, and then they charge us through the nose and yes. spend a lot of time yes. doing, you know, uh, actually the, the marketing, public relations, advertising business was invented in the 40s. Look at it. But to basically cover up the wrongdoing of the monopolies. You know, um, I was in the field. I, you know, I was raised by an Iron Man neoliberal, you know, Nazi, really, you know, um, that, and so I was kind of brainwashed and very brainwashed, really, uh, okay. to always only see one side of the coin. What time do we start? Three? Three is minutes. Three is minutes when you're is, done. is over. Okay. Anyhow, we have to. Uh, be, you know, watch out for the supply side, and we can, we've got a challenge up there. Also, the contract with America was when the Telecommunications Act. I think we should show the way it was thrown out, along with the Fairness Doctrine. Uh, try to show the criminality okay. of the Finish. monopoly, a political monopoly, which is essentially not. And you're fashion. causing criminal violations by taking Finish. somebody else's time. A few months ago, Charlie sent out on the email looking for somebody to do a talk on electromagnetic radiation. I, having a background in electronics and radio and things like that, I volunteered. Uh, my presentation will be on September 7th. It's going to be about electromagnetic radiation. It's going to an education on electromagnetic radiation. I'm going to talk about what it is, how it works, uh, what all the different bands and such mean. Um, so if you want to be educated on what electromagnetic radiation is, and I will also talk a little bit about 5 and 4G and how my knowledge of those, come on September 7th and you will be educated. A few things I want to say about the presentation tonight. I asked about millimeter radiation. They couldn't tell me what it is used for. I've seen it in many articles in my research, but, no, but none of them say what it is used for. To my knowledge, 4G and 5G both operate in the 5.2 gigahertz band. <coughs> millimeter radiation is 30 gigahertz to 500 gigahertz which is nowhere near 5.2 gigahertz. And I would say, yes, there would be more harmful effects in the higher frequencies. This is higher frequencies, smaller wavelengths. It can cause more problems. But to my knowledge, to my research, anything under x-rays is not very harmful at all because it, it, they even refer to it properly as non-ionizing radiation. You don't really start having problems until you get up into ionizing radiation. Another problem I have with my research and somewhat this presentation here tonight is they only cited one person who was uh, diagnosed as having definitely something happened to him from radiation. One person. Oh. That that could be a freak. You're not telling the truth. Right. It's kind of hard when you don't acknowledge it. Yeah. Hard when you don't I'm not saying. Hey, I'm open. I'm open. They talked about hundreds of research papers. There's the bio initiative. Alone. Research isn't people actually getting sick. There are a lot more. They talked about research on. Rats. That can yeah, only. Rats. Hey, one fool at a time. I sat and listened when they were talking. I'd appreciate yeah, if they would do the down. same for me. Research on rats can be rigged too, because if you remember when NutraSweet came out and they had to get rid of saccharin, they took rats, fed them saccharin until they got sick. Because to get in your human body the concentration of saccharin they had in those rats, you would have to drink six 12 packs a day for a year and I don't know anybody who's going to do that okay yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. all right one next study. would you volunteer next. for a human one study guy. <laughs> all right three minutes okay this is not what I came up for but the I would like to say this about what the gentleman just said about saccharin 
My mother uh, had cancer of the bladder. She was a huge saccharine uh, taker. She had it every day in her teeth. And they did associate saccharin with cancer of the bladder. So I think that his estimates are way out. Um, what, I came, what I came up to say was the impacts, uh, environmental impact statement that we now have to see before 5G is deployed should be recognized by everyone in this room and we should call our aldermen and the mayor and say we recognize that 5G that might be very dangerous and we want to see an impact statement before it's deployed. That's really important. The second uh, statement I'd like to make is the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals had another ruling in July of this year that said if you buy a cell phone, you have a right to know the dangers that it presents. And on every cell phone package that is sold, clearly it states, it should state, that you do not hold this cell phone next to your ear and it should state all the dangers of the radiation that have never been clearly stated before. Uh, and then they mention how they came, the court came to this decision. One of the factors is that the manufacturers themselves in small detailed print say to their customers, do not hold this cell phone to your ear. So the statements are there, the evidence is there, and let's get it out to everyone. Thank you. Jonathan, three minutes. It's right here. Thanks, the speakers. Uh, great topic tonight. I'm glad to see a large turnout, especially a large turnout of both male and female participants. Um, when are we the people going to get our lives back? Uh, when are we going to actually get what we're owed, which is health, living wages, grassroots democracy, civilization, peace, etc. In this country we have a national emergency alert system bell and it never goes off when rich, powerful, influential people conduct massive, violent crimes. Because those aren't crimes, those are nothing. The ruling class makes that clearly groomed into our head since we're a little kid. When the rich kid in class does the most egregiously bad thing you can think to do, that rich kid in class is told, don't do that again. When the poor kid in class does that same crime, he's expelled from the school. Uh, that's our national scene right now, <coughs> the equivalent. So uh, we do need to mass mobilize to the corporate death cult because it's based on unfacts. It's based on unmath. It's based on unfairness, unfreedom, ununity, unfamily, unsense. And that's toxic because we have corporate airwaves telling us constantly that uh, the gatekeepers are concerned. Yeah, they're concerned about what your response will be. If your response will be is to watch more television, then we're done. If your response to be is to uh, vote for a Democrat or Republican, we're done. If your response to be is to get uh, involved in an organization that wants to mildly reform, we're done. In 1775, they didn't like the king because the king was a violent bastard devil. He wasn't this guy that we wanted to make friends with eventually. You know, and that's not to say that we should all take up, you know, arms, but we should have that same understanding that peacefully and democratically we can say no in mass. I don't see this as being a difficult thing when everybody shows up. If you bring your kids and your grandkids and your parents and your grandparents peacefully and democratically and say there's a lot of people who are now going to go to jail, we're saying no in mass. That's actually a very, very powerfully peaceful thing. It's a very legal thing. And as far as I know, there's nothing in the Constitution against it. But it's really hard to do that when people are afraid. 
I know I got a couple seconds left. This is by Henry David Thoreau. I'm going to paraphrase. We did not see why an institution would treat us as that, as if we were just mere flesh, blood, and bones to be locked up. There was a difficult wall to climb or to break. Though before they could get to be as free, a great waste of stone okay. and mortar and every threat, there was a blunder that they were really all that was dangerous. As they could not reach us. All right, your time they is had up. Resolved, I don't give a shit. They well, not they to punish my body. Then you're stealing from we the other saw, speakers. Other speaker, can I have 20 seconds? That's a yes, thank you. <laughs> we saw that the state was half-witted. We lost all our remaining respect for the state, and the state is not armed with superior wit or honesty to us, but with superior physical strength. We were not born to be forced. When we meet a government which says to us, your money or your lives, why should we be in haste to give it our money? Okay, if Jonathan, it's time's up. If a plant cannot live according to its nature, it Jonathan, dies, please. So Ten more seconds. No, let's get off so we can get the next person up. I'm sorry, let's go. We're running out of time. Okay. We're running out of time, please. I'm sorry. large words and make them intelligible and interesting and I thank you very much for what I learned tonight <clears throat> but I want to say in my life I have not known too many of my friends who had babies um, but all of a sudden recently I had two friends whose daughters both developed uh, brain tumors non-malignant around nine months before after I don't remember which but um, I, I just know. thought that was very fishy, yeah. and I'm sure they're yeah. both cell phone users, and I had always wondered why this happened, and now I'm thinking maybe hormonal fluids in the brain and that with, with the combination of, of cell phone use, just maybe that was a perfect storm for a brain tumor. One was a yeah. schwannoma? Sh sh no, that's a heart tumor. Oh, oh, okay, so, well, anyway, I remember writing that down. I said, one was maybe a glioma, but anyway, perfect storm, possibly. So, thank you very much. All right. You're up next, Caitlin, three minutes. Okay, I'm going to be quick. I just have one question, and that is, if this... If this is so dangerous, why don't more people know about it? And how come if this is so dangerous, then why does every known person have a cell phone, have internet, have a laptop, have a device of some sort that can connect to the internet? If it's so dangerous, why is it not outlawed? That's yeah. all I want to know. Because if this is really what is going to be happening, then this shouldn't be something you talk about here. This should be something you talk about at Capitol Hill, not here. Why? Thank you. All right, next. What's more important to talk about is here than Congress. All right, next. Three minutes with Kaylin for Congress. <laughs> I'd like to thank Kaylin for her awesome intro to what I'm about to say. Thank you, Kaylin. <laughs> Um, I can name several things that we now know are dangerous <coughs> that were introduced without any testing. How about oil pollution? Do you think oil is so safe? I think we all know about how dangerous oil pollution is. How about carbon dioxide pollution? I think we all know about climate change, don't we? How about plastic? Don't we know now about how toxic plastic is? How about insecticides? How many of you were doused with insecticides as kids and it took a, a, a scientist by, um, it took a book called Silent Spring to come out to make everybody know about the dangers of insecticides. And the very first sign of danger was among animals and rats. And it was not tested on people and it was used <coughs> systematically and now we're in the situation that we're in. So I really don't see any cause for surprise that here's yet 
one more dangerous untested technology and animal studies show the danger and there have not been any human studies as Senator Blumenthal that that video um, pointed out the industry executive had no answer to Senator Blumenthal's question have there been any human studies so I say duh Kaylin duh and so I urge everyone to take the three-page pamphlet that we are passing out and go to, there are many, many links on here you can read later, um, go to the Environmental Health Trust website. And then on the third page, there are three levels of actions to take. The federal level, um, we can have a law passed to revoke and, and I think we have heard the name Ajit Pai before. We know how corrupt that man is. So we know that um, there was a there was a lawsuit overturning his rule that the um, the telecoms don't need to follow NEPA rules. Um, so there is a proposal HR 530 that would revoke uh, that would enshrine that that the results of that lawsuit. And so you can call your representative to support that. And the U.S. Senate S-2012 has some co-sponsors, and that would be a good one to support. On the state level, we would love to have a commission to study the health effects okay. of 5G. So ask your new Governor Pritzker to support that and overturn SB 1451. Um, and you can call your Illinois reps and senators for the same. Your and time also, is up. we would love to have a public your health study. Your time so is up. I am finishing my sentence. Please call your alderman and mayor to support a public health study on 5G in Chicago. Thank you. All right. All right. All right. All right. All right. Okay, hi everyone. I'd like to thank the organizers of this evening and I'd like to thank the speakers. And um, I wanted to talk a little bit about SB 1451, which is a state law, and I believe there have been 21 states that have passed similar state laws to codify the FCC regulations, which pretty much say that the cell towers can be de deployed and placed anywhere that the telecom companies want them to be placed. SB 1451 has made it so that these cell towers can be placed anywhere outside of Chicago. Should, you know, you can, you won't have any recourse once they're put in in front of your house or whatever, according to this law that was signed by Governor Rauner. I haven't done the research to see if it's all a Republican-led effort, but now that we have Democrats are more in control of things, maybe we can get this turned over. There are a lot of health effects, especially with children. They're developing very fast. Their skulls are a lot thinner than, and their skin is a lot thinner. These microwaves cook things in your microwave oven by bouncing off the walls. They're kept mostly inside in a Faraday cage, which is basically what the microwave oven is. However, those microwaves are coming in a linear form when they come from, from an antenna to you. They're coming in a linear form and they slowly, basically produce the same result, which is to cook your skin and eventually your organs. So um, actually there is, uh, there are laws in Sweden now that have identified um, elect electro, um, electromagnetic hypersensitivity and has, have made that as a medical diagnosis. They have public health care in Sweden. We don't. We have mostly corporate health care. So, you know, figure that out for yourself. They're acknowledging this. And um, just think about the costs to the healthcare system from all these, these diseases that are going to be showing up that somebody's going to have to pay for and um, are not being acknowledged even by the doctors. They're not aware yet of the fact that people can be coming to their offices and having these illnesses. A friend of mine has a kid that's a teenager. She goes to Lincoln Park High School that has all these antennas up on the roof. She wears a Fitbit on her wrist. There's a big antenna on their corner, and they have Wi-Fi, and she's on her devices all the time. She has a strange problem that cannot be diagnosed by the medical doctors where she cannot focus her eyes. It took them three days of putting those, those drops that open your eyes up before they could even give her a prescription, and her vision has gone down 
so much in a year that's very unusual in a, in a kid that's uh, 18 years old. The doctors do not know what it is, but um, they had to give her blood tests, and now her eyesight is, is tremendously impaired. So maybe it's nothing. All right, thank you. All right, let's thank our speakers. Thank you very much. All the black shirt of five years. And thanks to Tim and Paul for getting us rocking and rolling here. I'll be eclectic as usual here. It's been at least a quarter of a century as an occupational safety and health officer for the federal government. Uh, I represented employees in many, many what they call an on the job injury cases, the situations in which you establish that the employee was in fact injured on the job and it could go anywhere from providing he, he or she with reasonable accommodation or all the way to disability retirement. I actually looked into, uh, <coughs> I actually did this on my own many, many years ago. Uh, I called it divergent energy sources and I was claiming a disability retirement on the basis of fluorescent lights in the office over my desk. Uh, That's to the establish reason. this, right. <laughs> the government denied my request and instead they gave me a crystal to put on my desk. But not to make light of this issue, I have gone back to the days when we seriously had proposals <coughs> and contracts regarding excluding pregnant women from working at a standard computer screen. We were uncertain of the health effects. I dealt many things with IAQ, which is called indoor air quality. I've also dealt many, many situations <coughs> with sick building syndrome. By the way, you were trying to establish how hazardous this was. I was thinking of the fact I could establish how everything in this room is hazardous to our health from that carpeting, which is full of disease and who knows what, to the lighting and everything I could establish a case. Now, the thing is, what I was listening for is called a PEL. And can you establish, it doesn't sound like you have what a PEL is the permissible exposure level. And you have to establish that the individual that exceeded this level, like a friable asbestos. You measure it, and have they, what are the standards? And these standards even change over time. But it's a wide-ranging area, and I don't think uh, the PELs have been established for that. Until you do so, you have a thing. Now, the other thing I'm going to say, be cautious about this. Does anybody here know the difference between inductive and deductive logic? Mm -hmm. In deductive logic, you come up with an assertion, and then you go looking around for information to buttress it. In inductive, you do investigative research, more like a scientist does. And that's what I look for. Uh, first, to grab on any information that you can, but I think you guys were pretty clear in that regard. But anyhow, thank you very much for your effort to come back and report on the progress you've made in this regard. And we'd like to hear, we're going to listen to you, pal, uh, coming okay. up in September, so we'll get a little different perspective on this. So thank you very much. Thank okay. You. Five minutes. Speaker wraps up. Speaker gets the last word. See, you I got five more minutes about. to uh, rebut and say your last presentation. <laughs> your last <laughs> words. <laughs> Speakers get the last word. Speakers get the last word. Five minutes. We got to be out of here at 8:45. Um, I, I want to point out uh, one more time, I thought it was clear, but maybe not, that when you're looking for research, you need to look at who funded it. You need to make sure that it is independent by independent scientists and that it is not funded by a telecommunication company. It's very important to make sure that you do that. Um, I stood up here and I used fact. I didn't stand up here with my opinion. This was science, data, research based. This is not, you know, this is facts. I went online and I made sure that I went to the Environmental Health Trust, I went to the FCC. Everything was double checked. It was fact based. I didn't stand up here and tell you what I thought. Okay.
Okay, you got. You've still got a few minutes, so comment if you'd like. Okay, I will. Um, what I was, what I was going to initially say to kind of link to your question. Um, I don't know if you, uh, the cane. He just passed away from glioblastoma. Um, he was always known to carry two cell phones around with him at all times. When he moved to a remote location um, in the woods where he wasn't getting cell phone reception. AT&T came out and put a cell phone tower on his property. Once Verizon find out, found out, they came and, re and re put a cell phone tower on his property as well. He died from a glioblastoma, which is directly correlated to cell phone radiation. So all we're asking you guys is to look into this for yourself. Um, and for you to honestly say that, why do we have Wi-Fi and cell phone? Did, and I know we, I mean no disrespect whatsoever, but did you watch the beginning of the slideshow? When we talked about the reason why the FCC why we are seeing these things today because they're not regulated. So I think we all need to come together and really research this um, independently and, and come and make your own informed decision because unfortunately you're not going to find it on Google and Yahoo like we said. Um, and we have children. Um, we, live in, we live in the 19th ward. There's an ongoing compass study. Uh, we have very sick people in our ward. The last thing we need is constant radiation every single block in residential areas. We get the need for faster internet, um, but it doesn't have to be at the, the expense of our health and our children. Um, so it's never been tested. Let's test it first if there's nothing to worry about. That's all that we're, we stand for. Um, we just want to we want it tested. Any more last words? Okay. Gavel us out and dismiss us then. Just tell us that we're dismissed and have a good night. Pound the board. Thank you, thank you for coming out, everybody. All right. That wraps up the College of Complexes tonight. Thank you for coming. Appreciate everybody coming in.